At the age of 22, Debbie Dorian was living in Fresno, California and attending Fresno State University, where she was set to graduate with a degree in economics. On August 22, 1996, Debbie and her father were planning a trip to San Francisco, but her father became concerned when Debbie never showed up at his house. He then made repeated calls to her apartment but received no answer. When he called her employer at the Piccadilly Inn at the Fresno Airport, he learned that she hadn't shown up for work the day before. He then went to her apartment and sadly found her lifeless body. She was bound at the hands and feet with duct tape, which was also used to wrap her head, mouth, nose, and eyes. She was then sexually assaulted and murdered. In 2002, the suspect's DNA from Debbie's sexual assault kit matched numerous sexual assaults in Visalia from July 1999 to August 2002. But the technology needed to process the DNA was not advanced enough at the time. The sexual assault victims had similar descriptions of how the crimes were committed, leading investigators to believe they had a serial rapist on their hands. The assaults began several years after Debbie's murder, or at least the reported ones. Over the next few years, Debbie's murder case would go cold. That is until two retired detectives came out of retirement and reopened her case. For the first time ever in Tulare County, California, a decision was made to file a John Doe arrest warrant. On July 1, 2009, the DA's office filed an eight-count felony complaint listing a description of the suspect and the DNA profile without knowing the suspect's identity. Finally, using DNA from the first sexual assault in 1999, a profile was created and used for genetic genealogy. The work paid off and led them to suspect Nikki Duane Stain of Visalia, California. On October 3, 2019, the police arrested Stain at Charlie's Philly Stakes inside the Visalia Mall and charged him with eight felony assault charges. We use the word cringe a lot these days to describe someone who acts embarrassingly or awkwardly in an attempt to get people to like them, and I would say Stain really fits this mold. In recent years, Stain had created a second Facebook page with his photos and posted that he was the chairman of the board of directors for a Fortune 500 company. He created the second Facebook page under a different name, Nick Steele, dedicated to luring women on dates with him. On his second fake Facebook, he frequently asked for drinking partners and dates and bragged about his made-up lifestyle. He once posted pictures from a car show, writing, Car show today, looking for one with a big back seat for me and you, and posted photos of alcohol. Is that right? A woman responded. Nick Steele wrote, Yes, for me and you and the other 100-plus lady friends on my Facebook. Hey, this is for all you people that are wondering what was the disco light ball in the back. So here you go. For your pleasure. Stain's criminal history dates back to the 1980s, including a few misdemeanor sexual offenses in Fresno County, but no prior felony arrest or convictions. According to his Facebook page, he graduated from Exeter Union High School in 1985 and has held several jobs, including working as an Uber and Lyft driver in the Visalia area. Lyft recognized that he had not worked for them since 2017 and permanently removed him for safety after learning of his charges. However, he did work for Uber in 2017 and 2018 and possibly longer. In this wedding announcement from 2002, it appears that he was employed by Ryan's Place Restaurant. In the alleged sexual assaults, he used a black handgun in every instance, and all of the victims were in their late teens or early 20s, except for one assault against a 41-year-old woman. The suspect typically used a hooded sweatshirt drawn tight around his face, and on one occasion, used a bandana to conceal his face. He's also accused of recording someone in a bathroom. Meanwhile, he carried on as a divorced father and grandfather, likely keeping his evil secrets from his loved ones. He continues to await trial for the string of sex crimes and has not yet been charged with Debbie's murder. Fresno County District Attorney Lisa Smithcamp confirmed that authorities anticipate that a murder charge will be filed soon. 
She stated that Nikki Stain is every woman's nightmare. He appears to be a regular person, but is instead a sexual predator who has terrorized women over the years. As of November 2022, he continues to await trial, and we all know DNA doesn't lie, and his time is thankfully up. Cynthia May Hernandez was born on June 7, 1958, and went by Cindy. At the age of 18, she was a graduate of Charter Oak High School and was living in Glendora, California. She and her two siblings were all talented singers. In addition, she was an athletic young woman who played volleyball, football, and baseball. On August 26, 1976, she left her home to see a horror movie at Fox Twins Theaters in Covina to watch The Omen. Her boyfriend was sick with the flu, and her friends had already seen the movie, so she went alone but sadly never returned. The next morning, her family discovered her 1963 white Chevrolet station wagon backed into the parking lot behind the theater at 211 North Azusa Avenue. Her mother reported her missing and stated that Cindy was a homebody who had never even spent more than three nights away from home. The only clue police had was a theater employee who said she had a scary encounter with a man as she was leaving work the evening Cindy went missing. She said the stranger approached her and said he was a photographer and asked to take a picture of her. Instead of taking the picture, he put his hand inside her blouse and told her she had a figure that attracted men. Despite this worrying testimony, police could not track the man down or determine if the incident was linked to Cindy's disappearance. Later that year, on October 14, 1976, a dog dug up a skull on some property owned by the Allred family. Initially, authorities thought the skull was from a Native American burial ground, but they were wrong and it would take 40 years before the truth was known. In 1978, Two high school students aged 16 and 17 were walking down the street near Covina when three men in a car pulled up next to them. The men persuaded the girls to get in the car and go to a party with them. But instead of going to a party, the girls were taken to the Twin Peaks cabin in the woods, tied up and repeatedly sexually assaulted for an entire week. One of the men told them he planned to kill them as he had done to the Mexican girl and even went as far as to dig a pair of shallow graves in the yard. Somehow, he was persuaded to release the two traumatized girls close to where they had been kidnapped on the condition that they never tell a single soul what happened. The two girls did the exact opposite and went straight to the police, leading to the arrest of the men. The ringleader was Larry James Allred, who had already had a long rap sheet and whose family owned the Twin Peaks cabin. Los Angeles County Crime Lab personnel sent to the cabin reported a grave in the forest. The lead detective went up to the site with search and rescue personnel and volunteers. After searching around the graveside and not finding anything else, he went back to the cabin and began searching underneath the porch. This is when he discovered five human rib bones. The two other suspects in the rapes of the teens would later tell investigators that Allred wanted to get rid of the victims and had shown them the ribs. The bones belonged to an unidentified Mexican girl that Allred bragged about killing. It would take 30 years before the ribs and the skull were connected through DNA. The identity of the victim remained unknown and her DNA was put into the database. By 2014, Glendora Police Chief Tim Staub decided to investigate the case again. So he took DNA from Cindy's mother, Gloria, and one of her other daughters. He sent it to the California Department of Justice to see if it matched any unclaimed bodies in California since 1976. By December, investigators were able to match Cindy's DNA to the remains found at the Twin Peaks cabin. That's when San Bernardino County Sheriff's investigators took over the case and charged Allred with Cindy's murder. Allred pleaded guilty to her murder and was sentenced to life in prison. He has been in prison since 2013 
after pleading guilty to importing and selling counterfeit collectible Disney pins. Allred admitted he committed three more rapes for which he was never caught and told detectives he liked to hunt his victims, which was more gratifying than the act itself. In 1976, Allred lived in Hacienda Heights and owned an auto detailing shop in West Covina. He didn't know Cindy when he pulled up next to her in the theater parking lot. With a knife, he forced her into the back of his pickup. He said when he put the knife down to tie her up, she fought back so he strangled her. He then drove to the San Bernardino Mountains where he buried the body in a shallow grave across the road from his family's cabin in Twin Peaks. Finally, after four decades, Cindy's loved ones were able to properly lay her to rest. Jenny Marie Moore was born on September 16, 1962. At the age of 18, Jenny lived in Jefferson County, Colorado, and was described as a tough but loving and kind person. She was one of seven siblings who had lost their father early in their life, so Jenny became like a second mother to her younger siblings. On August 25, 1981, around 7 a.m., Jenny left home to make her shift at the Tenneco gas station at 13th and Wadsworth Boulevard in Lakewood, but she was running late because the family car was being used. So she decided to hitchhike to work and started at the Harland Street on-ramp for westbound Interstate 70. Witnesses said they saw her get into an older red Ford Galaxy or LTD. This is the last time anyone would ever see her alive again. Five days later, her deceased body was found in Genesee Park, south of I-70, by people having a picnic. She had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death, and the case would go unsolved for the next 38 years. In 2019, DNA from the crime scene was used to create a DNA profile. That profile was then used for genetic genealogy, which led investigators to killer Donald Perea. But Perea died of health problems in 2012 at age 54, so investigators reached out to his biological daughter, who was happy to help by providing her DNA. That DNA matched the DNA samples taken from the crime scene. Perea would have been 23 at the time of the murder and was out on bond when this sexual assault and murder occurred. He had been accused of kidnapping and sexually assaulting a woman in Westminster and had recently bonded out and was awaiting trial. He was later convicted of rape in that case and was in prison between 1982 and 1985. The Moore family says the last 38 years have been spent wondering who took Jenny's life and pointing fingers at all the wrong people, including a family member. Hopefully, now that this case has closure, Jenny can finally rest in peace. Anna Marie Halavka was born on October 28, 1958. Anna, now 20 years old, was said to be well-mannered and straight-laced. She and her sister, Rose Ann Halavka, who both worked at a nearby McDonald's, were sharing an apartment with Anna's fiancé at 1811 Northwest Couch Street, number 103, in Portland, Oregon. On July 24, 1979, after her shift at McDonald's, Anna was seen heading into her apartment at 5 p.m. Sometime between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m., tragedy would strike. After Rose's shift ended at 10 p.m., she came home and began calling out for her sister, but received no response. When she walked into the bedroom, she found Anna's lifeless body. Anna had been strangled by the electric cord from her clock radio and possibly sexually assaulted. DNA was collected from the crime scene, including DNA from under her fingernails. Detectives interviewed numerous persons of interest at the time, but no suspects were developed and her murder would go unsolved for the next 40 years. In 2011, they were able to recover an unknown male DNA profile from crime scene evidence. Over the next four years, 
Authorities submitted DNA from eight different people to try to identify her killer, but none of the DNA submissions matched the crime scene. That's when they began the process of forensic genetic genealogy. This led authorities in Texas to the family members of Jerry Walter McFadden, a serial killer and serial rapist known as Animal. However, McFadden was a convicted murderer who had already been executed in Texas in 1999. But his family members were gracious enough to provide their DNA for comparison. From that, the Oregon State Police Crime Lab connected McFadden to Anna's murder and announced their finding at a press conference on January 31, 2019. Detectives also confirmed that McFadden had traveled to the Pacific Northwest in 1979, the year of Anna's murder. Due to his execution date, his DNA profile was never entered into the FBI CODIS database for comparison. Nevertheless, he is known as the killer and rapist who led police on the biggest manhunt in Texas history. According to records, McFadden was sentenced to 15 years in prison on two counts of rape in 1973 and got parole in December 1978, eight months before Anna's murder. Detectives have since learned McFadden went to the Pacific Northwest in 1979 with a woman who reported dropping him off in Portland and then had no further contact with him. That same year, McFadden was convicted of kidnapping and raping an 18-year-old woman at Knife Point but was paroled again in 1985. He was arrested again less than a year later for raping and killing an 18-year-old high schooler and shooting two others. McFadden was in jail awaiting a capital murder trial when he escaped and kidnapped a corrections officer, holding her hostage for three days. More than a thousand officers were involved in the manhunt for McFadden, and his crimes led to parole changes in Texas. It remains unknown why McFadden was so far away from his stomping grounds in Texas, committing heinous crimes, but at least he can no longer violate and take away any more innocent lives. In 1974, 29-year-old Barbara Hall was a resident of Panoma in East Los Angeles, California, and had a developmental delay. Barbara worked at a school caring for infants, and her usual routine was to take the bus to and from work. But on August 12, 1974, unbeknownst to Barbara, there was a bus strike that day. With no bus to take, Barbara had to find other means to get home, but would never make it. The next day, her body was discovered on a horse trail near Mills Avenue and Mount Baldy Road in the area bordering San Dimas and Claremont. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Barbara had no defensive injuries and was known to be distrustful of strangers. This led investigators to believe that she was likely forced to go with her murderer. DNA was collected from the crime scene, but the case would go cold. Her case was reopened many years later in 2010, and cold case detectives were able to use new DNA technology that wasn't available at the time of the murder. Old evidence slides were tracked down at the city's coroner's office, and crime lab technicians were able to match the DNA sample to a suspect named Robert Edward Stansberry. But Stansberry died at the age of 60 in San Quentin State Prison while on death row for the murder and sexual assault of 10-year-old Robin Lee Jackson. In 1982, while on parole, he invited Robin into his ice cream truck in Baldwin Park, Los Angeles, to get free ice cream and candy. After brutally assaulting little Robin, he dumped her into a flood control channel in Pasadena where she was ultimately found. In 1985, he was convicted of first-degree murder, kidnapping, rape, and lewd acts on a child under 14. This led to his DNA being collected and placed on file and later used to solve Barbara's case. To get closer to children, Stansberry began driving an ice cream truck during the summer of 1982. This is what helped him kidnap and murder Robin Jackson. 
an arrogant, egotistical Stansberry chose to represent himself at the trial for Robin's murder, which began in 1984 and ended 11 months after filing 160 motions. Stansberry covered much of the San Gabriel Valley and other areas of East LA in his ice cream truck between 1974 and 1982. Stansberry used the truck as a ruse to commit his criminal acts. He had a history of abduction and rape dating back to 1959, and police in California always believed there were other victims. In November 1963, Stansberry was convicted of lewd and lascivious conduct for oral copulation on two 10-year-old boys in the San Joaquin Valley. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but was released early in January 1969. From California, Stansberry went to Oklahoma City, where he raped a woman in December 1970, but only received a two-year sentence. He was released in November 1973. On November 24, 1974, a few months after Barbara Hall was murdered, Stansberry forced a 14-year-old girl into his car at gunpoint, raped her twice, and then released her in Pomona. Five days later, Stansberry abducted a 21-year-old Mount Clare woman outside a bar and raped her twice before letting her go. He was convicted in a single trial on both counts, but only served six and a half years in prison. He was released on October 10, 1981. Even though justice may have never been served, at least Barbara's two surviving sisters finally have some answers as to who took their sister's life all those years ago. 